This presentation was recorded at the 2015 ANZICS ACCCN Annual Scientific Meeting. The next speaker is um, Dr Paul Baker, who's speaking about the paediatric difficult airway. Um, Paul's been around as a consultant at Starship for almost 30 years now. He's also a, a senior lecturer at the University Department of Anesthesia, and he completed his MD last year. Very good MD if you want to uh, read it one day. <laughs> the, you know, those... MDs are so huge, I think the only person who ever reads them is, is the author and maybe the examiner. But one of my friends in his MD, or his PhD, he wrote, if you read this line, I'll give you a bottle of champagne. No one ever claimed it. <laughs> um, Paul founded the Airway Skills course, uh, which was established in New Zealand, and now it's uh, internationally right throughout Australasia. Um, he's, he's also developed this fantastic little bronchoscopy uh, device where you can practice with your bronchoscope. Wonderful. You should all buy one for your department. And he's a board member of the uh, Society of Airway Managements for, or internationally and throughout Australasia. So, Paul, come on up. Thank you very much, Brian, for that wonderful introduction. And um, this afternoon I'm going to talk to you about um, the difficult airway. Um, I'm a bit of a prostitute when it comes to airway management, so I've got a lot of conflicts of interest there. So there's some companies who've uh, very kindly donated equipment to the course that I run. Um, we'll move on. Now, this afternoon, in the limited time I have, because airway management's a massive topic, uh, so I'm just going to cover these three areas. Incidentally, the World Airway Management Meeting is on in two weeks. I'm so excited, and it's going to go on for four days. It's an absolute orgy of airway management. So if anybody is interested in airway management, that's the place to be, Dublin in November. Um, I can't wait to get there, but I, I'm going to give you a little snippet and discuss this tiny little aspect of airway management this afternoon. So first of all, identifying the difficult airway, and at the end of this section, I'm really going to tell you that you can't reliably predict and identify a difficult airway anyway, but you can make some effort. And in anaesthesia we're taught we have to do this and we diligently go and do tests and everything, but in fact the literature would suggest they're pretty unreliable. But it does help uh, certainly to take a, a history if you see a, a kid with dysmorphic features. I reckon the best thing to do first is to ask the mother about it because if the child's got a syndrome they'll have an encyclopedic knowledge about that syndrome. And in fact, if they mention a syndrome you've never heard of, go and have a look in the syndrome book. And invariably, uh, a syndrome has an airway component. So usually you'll find there's something to concern yourself about the airway. The anaesthetic history is useful. If the last anaesthetist had the worst day of their life looking after this child's airway and actually noted that in the notes, then it's probably worth knowing about and a surgical history. Well, if the surgeons have been meddling with the airway or the kids had some radiotherapy or something, certainly you want to know about that as well. And take an airway history. You know, does the child have uh, obstructive sleep apnea? Do they wheeze? Do they have stride or... You want to know about that sort of thing. And then we get down to the physical examination. Well, there are various risk factors that are worth knowing about, um, but we look at each aspect of the airway. In the old days, we were just obsessed with putting tubes down, so we're only interested in tracheal intubation risk factors. But now we look at all aspects of the airway, that's where the international guidelines are all headed, and of course they're the four pillars of airway management. And if you've got two, two or three of those areas out of those four that are going to be difficult, you, you're in for a big problem. So it's worth looking at each aspect in um, separation. So there are certainly difficult aspects of uh, ventilation. Now, if the child has a, a very micronothic undershot retrograde airway uh, jaw, then their airway is going to be difficult to hold, particularly maybe during an induction. And if they've got maxillofa maxillofacial problems, it may be hard to get a good mass seal. And similarly with supraglottic airways, I mean, if the, there's a good little mnemonic in rods. So if, if you have very restricted mouth opening, like they just won't open their mouth, you can't get a supraglottic airway in there, that's obvious. Or if they've got an obstruction at or around the glottis, or a disrupted airway, then physics dictates the gas is going to come out through the neck and not go into the lungs. And if they've got stiff lungs, you know, if they're a drowning victim, or if they've got bronchospasm, then you're not going to ventilate the lungs ahead of the stomach. So these are features that make supraglottic airways probably less attractive. Difficult intubation, think of the letter T. That sums most of them up. So teeth, tongue, tonsils, torticollis, thick neck, thyroid disease, you know, it goes on and on. Letter T, very useful. 
and surgical airways. Well, if, if the kid's got a huge mass in the neck, then that's a no-go zone, then you're going to be very careful with the other three. And also, if you think it's a dodgy airway, maybe it's worth spending some time in identifying where would you would go in a hurry. So you, some people even map the neck out with an ultrasound and mark it up and put where they would go if they had to do a surgical airway. Special investigations are worth doing and maybe some of these bedside tests. I've got more to say about that in a second. Now, these are what I call the canaries. I mean, you can probably notice from the back of the room that there's something unusual looking about each of those children. Most of them have syndromes. You don't necessarily need to know the names, but you can see they're not right. Now, there are kids there who are going to get better, like the Treacher Collins in the middle of bottom row. Or, oh, sorry, they get worse, but the Pierre Raban, they get better. So it depends on what age they are. In the middle there, there's a Hurler syndrome. They're a nightmare in terms of airway management. These are the sparrows. These are the kids who we often overlook. We think they look fine. You know, they often turn up in the middle of the winter to have their tonsils out or something, and they've had a bit of a runny nose. And you induce them, and they obstruct, and they've got secretions everywhere, and they go into a laryngospasm, and they desaturate, and they're a nightmare. So we think, always think of syndromes and dysmorphic-looking kids. By far, these are the more common reasons of difficult airways in paediatrics. Um, there are some useful bits of information to glean from tests, from imaging. I mean, the top um, left there is a good point um, to remember that the airway extends from the nostrils or the lips down to the alveoli. So you may have a normal-looking child who's having a bit of postural dyspnea, do an X-ray, and there's a big mediastinal mass. The child on the right there had um, triple field syndrome, so they've got fusion of their cervical spine and a very unstable C1. So that's going to be a difficult airway if you start cranking that neck around and you'll have difficulty extending the neck. It's pretty obvious the bottom left has got a severe micronathia and fused TMJs, and the bottom right is the most interesting of the lot. That was a child that was treated for asthma for a couple of years and wasn't getting better, and they'd done a few x-rays and never came up with anything, and so eventually the child came and had a laryngoscopy, and lo and behold, there was a spring stuck in the glottis, and our very talented ENT surgeon, who's going to follow me, he unscrewed the screw, and out it came. It was a spring out of a ballpoint pen, and the asthma got better because they weren't aspirating anymore. Now, the interesting thing about that story is that child's x-rays never showed the spring because the x-rays never go as high as the thyroid, so you don't see that sort of foreign body sitting in the larynx. Bedside screening tests. By and large, a bit of a waste of time, I'm afraid, but we all religiously do them. We do the thyromental distance, the malampati, we extend the neck, but none of them have predictive values more than about 30%. So really, it's a bit of this, you know, 50-50 chance you're going to be right. So to be, to be safe, really, because the predictive ability of all of these tests is so poor, you should regard every airway as potentially difficult because only half the time you're going to be right. If all of those people there have a difficult airway and you apply your bedside test to all of them, you're only going to find half of them. Right, ventilation. Now, ventilation, bag mass ventilation in particular, is the absolute cornerstone of airway management. So when everything else fails, we devolve down to bag mass ventilation. And it's often taken for granted, but actually it is quite a skill, and you need to practice it to get better. So here we have good technique. We have the double CE grip, uh, bilateral, and somebody else is squeezing the bag. And then you can see that in paediatrics, the incidence of difficult bag mass ventilation is relatively low. It's only about 6.6%. This is a really interesting little study. This shows the benefit of experience and the ability to effectively bag mass ventilate. So on the left, you've got consultants. And on the right, you've got the other extreme, a student nurse. And what they did was drain the stomach to pull the air out of the stomach. And it measured the changes in um, FRC. And so there was very little improvement by the nurse because, um, sorry, the FRC wasn't, didn't make a big factor for the consultant, but a lot of air came out of the stomach for the student nurse. Superglottic airways. Whenever I go around to pick I don't actually see these very often. Um, I know they're probably in the difficult airway trolley, but they tend not to be used. Certainly in anesthesia, we love them. Probably half of our anesthetics are done on these things. But I would, would suggest they have a place in intensive care 
They're a great fallback position. For example, if you have a difficult intubation and things aren't going well, uh, regroup, come out, don't keep on repeating the intubating, put one of these in and just uh, have a little cup of tea and think about what you're going to do next while one of these is actually secure the airway. Another good use is as a conduit for a difficult airway. Now, awake intubation, this is a hitherto been considered inappropriate in paediatrics. Kids aren't cooperative. They're not going to put up with it. Well, not so. There are ways of going about this in a modified way with children. The next slide I borrowed from one of my colleagues in the States, Sim Jaganathan. This is a, a baby with a difficult airway having a, an air cue put in. So it's a neonate, and it's done under either no sedation or mild sedation. He has a very, very cynical way of doing this. He puts a dummy, gets a dummy, stabs a whole lot of holes in the dummy and injects about 5 mils of 2% lignocaine into the dummy, a gel, lignocaine gel, pops that in the mouth and the baby sucks it for a few minutes and it numbs up the mouth, and then you pop in the um, supraglottic airway. Now, of course, once you've got that in place, you can hook up to the circuit, give oxygen in your favourite volatile agent, and send the baby off to sleep. And there's no hanging on to this micronathic jaw and hoping like hell you're going to lose it because you've got a nice secure airway from the outset. Once you've got the supraglottic airway in, with the aid of a swivel connector, that little yellow thing, you can introduce a flexible scope. You put two tracheal tubes of the same size, ram them together so you've got a big long tracheal tube, go through with your flexible scope, come out the end, there's the vocal cords, down the trachea, then advance your tracheal tubes. You've got two rammed together, so you've got plenty of tube down there. You can then pull your scope out, then pull out the LMA with the swivel connector, and because you've got plenty of length of tracheal tube, all you do is, once you've pulled the LMA off, just pull the proximal tube apart, and you're left with your tracheal tube in. So it's a nice, neat way of intubating a baby through a supraglottic airway. You can do that with a classic LMA or one of these air cues. Now, I just want to tackle a, a couple of myths. Myth, myth number one, spontaneously breathing patients can't come to any harm. Well, is that necessarily true? Here's a baby breathing away, uh, actually struggling, but we're clinging to this concept that we don't want to take over the breathing or paralyze them. We're going to let them carry on breathing on their own. But actually, this baby's um, having respiratory arrest. The saturation's down to 77, and they need to have something done about it. So there is this great fear of using neuromuscular blockers in babies in some quarters. But you can see in this study where they compared uh, sevoflurane induction with 8% using a placebo, and look at the number of adverse effects there, 33%. The second group were given a bit of alfentanil, and the third group were paralyzed, and they got rid of all their adverse respiratory events. Myth number two, the use of muscle relaxants can cause severe hypoxia if the trachea cannot be um, ventilated. Well, this is actually confusing subsequence with consequence. I mean, the muscle relaxant didn't cause the severe hypoxia. If mass ventilation is impossible, in fact, a muscle relaxant may make ventilation better. And in fact, it may make intubation better. And in fact, it may make a surgical airway better to perform. There are a few exceptions, of course. You wouldn't paralyze a kid with a, a large mediastinal mass or mucopolysaccharides or tracheomalacia, but they're relatively rare, those conditions. So by and large, muscle relaxants are a good thing. I'm sorry, I'm gonna to default to some adult literature here because this is a massive study and it's worth knowing about, but um, this is a study that Keita Paul did on 53,000 elective anesthetic cases. It was done in the US. And they found 77 cases of impossible bag mass ventilation. And the interesting, thing is, all but four of those 77 were actually paralyzed. And nearly all of them were successfully and relatively easily intubated. So the message I took from this is, if I can't bag mask, ventilate somebody, paralyze them and intubate them. And there's a really good chance it's going to work. And the other interesting thing is, this is elective anesthesia, but there was only one cricothyroidotomy in that 53,000 patients. Right, now, the last little section is on intubation. And I'll just run through very quickly these aspects of tracheal intubation. So first of all, preparation. Now, we're all into cognitive aids at the moment. Um, 
to help our brains think. And here's a little mnemonic. Now, trouble is, as you start losing your memory, you can't remember what the mnemonic stands for. <laughs> um, but that it is a useful little list, I guess. So remember to have suction and tubes and um, your drugs and put an IV in. And then connect things up to your monitoring. That's important, particularly pulse oximetry and capnography. And then select your correct blade. Make sure you've got adjuncts like bougies and stilettes ready. And maybe an alternative because your plan A may not work, so you need a plan B. And then some res rescue oxygenation. And by the way, oxygen is my favourite drug. I'll come to that in a minute. And then think ahead. If all else fails, maybe you end up doing a surgical airway, and how would you manage that? So it just runs you through your list before you start. Right, positioning. Positioning does actually matter. And the study's been done. It came out in the BJA uh, a year ago. Some people measured cormac lahan views. That's the view you get on direct laryngoscopy at different bed heights. So basically, as the bed goes up, the cormac lahan view it goes down and you want to have a, a low Cormac Lahan, you want to be one or two, because three or four are very poor views. So with you standing erect, with the uh, patient's um, face aligned to your zippy sternum, you get the best view. What about the patient's head position? Well, there's nothing new about this. In fact, Sheila Leah Jackson looked at this in 1915, and he put heads in different positions and concluded position C was the best. And we now recommend that the earlobe should be aligned with the sternal notch. Now, that's all well and good, but of course children come in different sizes, from neonates up to uh, adult-sized adult 16-year-olds, you know, over 100 kilos. So you've got to adjust the head position accordingly, whether or not you use pillows and ramp them up. But a little baby like that, their head's disproportionately big. They don't need anything behind their head. In fact, some people even put things under their shoulders to get their earlobes lined up. And in a bigger kid, sure, you might put a pillow in to get the earlobe lined up with the sternal notch. These things, they may seem simplistic, but they actually do make a difference to your intubation attempt and your view of the larynx. Laryngoscope selection. Well, there's all sorts of opinions about what's the best laryngoscope in children. Is it a straight blade or a curved blade? One thing for sure, the, the size is important. You don't want to have a blade that's the wrong length. And then there's video laryngoscopes. They improve things a bit. And there's optical stilettes. So there's a whole range of equipment that you could choose from. Video laryngoscopes, first, they definitely give you a better view. And it's quite seductive. When you put it in, you think, wow, I can see. You know, I know where I'm going now. But as this study shows, actually getting a good view, so this is um, back in 2007 versus 2014, so they gave them seven years to practice, the view um, didn't change much. The Cormac Lahan view 1 and 2, which remember 1 and 2 is the good view, were in the high 90s. But the first pass success, that changed dramatically. So with practice, they went from 75% up to 92%. So it's one thing to get a good view, a Cormac Lahan 1 and 2, it's another thing to get the tube in. And it only comes with practice. And the bottom half of this slide shows the same thing, really, with as you become more senior as a resident, PGY 1, 2, and 3, they're the number of years they're residents, they tend to get better because they're practicing more. Interestingly, their direct laryngoscopy, that's the bottom line, didn't change very much with experience. Now, there's some children where a video laryngoscope won't do the trick. And the video laryngoscopes are taking off. Anesthetists are using them a lot more, and they're, they're being used for the difficult airways. So if anesthetist sees a difficult airway or they're reading the chart last time they were difficult, they'll call for the video laryngoscope. But I have yet to see a video laryngoscope that will go through a nostril. So if a patient has a, a, a mouth that's shut or they've got a big tumour in their mouth, or for some other reason they're going to be difficult, a micronathic child, a flexible scope. In my opinion, you can't beat it. Now, I just want to go over the aspects of a difficult intubation. And the things that worry me are these things, and I call them the four horsemen of the apocalypse. So we have a difficult airway. Inevitably, you're going to be looking at hypoxia if you're not careful. There is a risk, risk of awareness. That may be the last thing you're going to be worried about, but there is certainly a risk of that. And trauma. So I'll just run through these. We all know that babies tend to desaturate 
They desaturate early compared to older children and adults. They desaturate at the same rate as adults, but they desaturate earlier. And that's because they have higher metabolism, their closing volumes overlap their um, fun functional residual capacity, so they have very little reserve in their lung. So in this uh, simulated graph here, they were pre-oxygenated for three minutes, but um, the baby still started to drop and desaturate after a simulated obstructed airway very early. So what can we do about that? Well, believe it or not, oxygen is a good idea. And if you put it on when you're intubating, during the intubation phase, it probably is going to help. And anecdotally, we have evidence for that, and we've just done a little study on this to show that actually intubation decreases hypoxic events during tracheal intubation. And you can give oxygen in various ways. So if you're going to give a nasal intubation, you can give some oxygen through the mask or you can still attach it to the tube as you push the nasal tube in. So my recommendation is give oxygen while you're intubating. Don't leave that little gap out of your procedure where you don't give oxygen. And of course, the anaesthetists have just invented the Optiflow. Isn't it amazing? I mean, it's been around for 10 years. You guys have known about it for over a decade. There's heaps of literature about it in your journals, but the anaesthetists are very skeptical about this. They've just heard about it this new device. Well, it's fantastic. I mean, it's exactly what we want. So there we have high flow, and we can't wait to research it. And the first paper came out in the anaesthetic literature this year in adults, and it was just a case series of 25 patients having laryngeal surgery with the Optiflow on, paralyzed patients having laryngeal surgery. That In one case, it went on for 65 minutes, and that was the only airway they had. It doesn't work if your airway is obstructed. So if the jaw drops and the tongue rolls back, it's not going to work very well. I mentioned awareness. This is an interesting study on awareness in kids, and the biggest uh, correlating factor to awareness during anesthesia in children was uh, prolonged airway procedures, long intubation attempts. It's pretty simple. Just remember to give them some intravenous drug if you think your anesthetic uh, intubation attempt is going to go on. Uh, avoid multiple intubation attempts. I'm sure you know this by now, but it just gets worse and worse and worse. There's over 12 studies on this now. Look, I mean, this is only, only two attempts, and all these awful things start cropping up after only two attempts. In the PICU, more than 1% um, of tracheal intubations in PICU experience cardiac arrest. So, you, you know, if you're going to beaver away at the larynx and have multiple attempts and multiple people having a go, your morbidity and or mortality is going to go up. And here's some of the airway injury you can cause uh, as a result of that. So just be very mindful of the harm you're doing with multiple repeated attempts. Now, no airway talk is complete without a mention of the NAP4. This is the biggest airway, airway audit in the world of 3 million patients in the UK. And in the NAP4, they found 184 patients with significant airway morbidity and or mortality. It included uh, intensive care patients, it included paediatric patients and ED patients. And in the ICU, 61% of events led to death or persistent neurological injury. Um, the year this came out, in 2011, the lead authors, there were three lead authors, the first author, Tim Cook, gave a, a keynote lecture at the Society for Airway Management, and he spoke for an hour. And at the end of his lecture, he said there are three key points from the NAP4 study. Point number one, capnography. Point number two, capnography, and you probably got the message. Point number three, capnography. So obviously Tim Cook thinks capnography is pretty important, and I think he's probably right. I mean, failure to use the capnograph contributed to 74% of ICU cases of death or persistent neurological injury. I know it is becoming more common to use capnography in the ICU, but it isn't universal yet. So it's maybe something worth thinking about. And this is a, an editorial from Anesthesia a few years ago now by Whitaker, um, and he's calling for capnography everywhere. Everywhere airways are managed, think of capnography. Last thing I want to mention is um, securing your tube. The incidence of paediatric unplanned extubation and reintubation is a significant problem. 
unplanned intubation occurs in between 0.1 and 2.3 events per 100 intubation days, and reintubation is required for 14 to 65 percent of unplanned extubation. So, I mean, I think the nurses are onto this. There's very good techniques to secure tubes to avoid extubation, but unplanned extubation carries significant morbidity. Thank you very much for listening to me.